Hi, this is Ed from Wright. Today we're going to have a conversation with CBQ, the CEO of GreenZ, and we're going to talk about our work together towards developing robotic mowers. Hi, this is Ed from Wright here we're with GreenZ. Uh, talking about robotic mowers. Uh, we're getting into the space where um, you know, labor's become an increasing issue and this is a need. And today we're gonna talk and announce about uh, some of the things we're doing. So uh, first off, what we're doing is we have a mower that operates in a manual mode and a robotic mower. And I'm gonna introduce CBQ. CBQ is the CEO of GreenZ. CBQ, if you would uh, introduce uh, yourself and what you're doing with uh, GreenZ. Hey Ed, thanks for having me. It's been awesome to work with you and we're excited to bring this to market. We've been working really hard on this and really coming from this from a whole other angle, but love to chat and tell your viewers and our viewers what we're, we've been working on. I'm anxious to get this out into the world. Yeah, so if you would, just let's just start off by talking about the workflow. Let's first kind of get a hook around what that is and then over the rest of this interview, we'll talk a lot more about the technology and whatnot. But, um, so let's talk about, we can see the mower behind you there. So when you show up on the job site, what do you do? Well, so that's fascinating because when we started this uh, a company, we wanted to help landscapers be more successful. And you know, we thought about building a better robo mower because I've had one since 2010. I mean, the patent around that's been around since 79 and they're just dumb. Uh, they don't work, uh, they don't cut. Uh, and you know, why is there no software version so we went and asked landscapers, some of the best in the industry, we're based in Atlanta, Georgia. And so we went on ride alongs and we said, how does it work? How, how do you mow lawns? And, and uh, the, generally the process is usually the same, uh, the good landscapers. And you know, we also watched your videos on this ad. If you haven't seen them, they're great. Uh, they generally go around the perimeter. You mow the perimeter. And there's a number of reasons you do that. But uh, when you go around the perimeter of a job site, you're basically picking up trash, surveying the property, seeing like how you'd sort of divide it up. And the other thing for a real quality cut is you're looking at the angles where you're gonna do that, put those nice stripes, because it's really is the, still the most efficient way to do it. I mean, these robo mowers, when they go above an acre, they just have to go all day. I mean, I think they Ooh. describe it as a feature, yeah. but um, so yeah, so you go around the boundary. And so what we do is we map that. We record that and we put that into our software. And then you just point the mower in the direction you want the stripes and you hit mow. It really is okay. that simple. Okay, awesome. Yeah, and so tell us a little bit about the last couple of years and getting to this point. We've been working really hard on this. Um, we've started out uh, trying to figure out how to uh, add our software to an existing mower. And uh, we struggled for a long time with trying to basically move the controls. Uh, we thought about trying to take over the system, but when we went on ride-alongs and then when we asked our customers, they said, look, what I'd really love is just to have the mower that I love that has a great quality cut you know, AeroCore deck, you know, I just want it to basically move, to help me out, to move by itself. If I could have autopilot for my mower, I could be more successful, do more jobs, uh, you know, come home earlier, uh, or right. frankly, bid bigger ones, which is awesome. Yeah. And we've been seeing that. So um, what we did is we started out trying to move those, uh, the, basically adding some servos to some existing commercial equipment. And that was a disaster. Uh, we tried for a long time, but uh, you know, the, the sheer, um, ruggedization needed uh you know there's a hundred and some years of innovation in you know lawn mowing technology there it makes no sense for us to try and reinvent the wheel i think a lot of robotics companies are trying to do that right now and there's no reason to you get a good mower like this that's literally been proven and can have long time running uh, so we basically found a way to do it with our friends from hydro gear have a can bus enabled uh, system right. so we uh, put our software on there and the controls are phenomenal uh yep. straight line tracking faster than a human can do it it is really something uh, to see this mower going at seven and a half miles an hour and just rock solid straight and it goes over a bump and it's, you know, changing the controls at about, you know, 200 times a second. And so it can just keep that straight line. It's, it's wild. It's really yeah, wild. It, it is amazing just where the technology is at. Uh, we'll get into the details uh, in a little bit about really kind of the lower level things of how the technology works. But let's for a second talk about the, the economics, the economic model around uh, where we are with labor and the, the, the uh, making a mower robotic and, and just the overall impact that that has on, on uh, the cost of production. Well, I'm going to go ahead and toot your own, own horn, Ed, because you're not going to do it. You're too modest. But uh, Ed's priced this thing uh, pretty awesome. Uh, I think 
probably 2x to 3x time uh, a normal mower. Is that right, Ed? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's about where we'll be, especially initially. I think we do anticipate that um, there will be a picking up, you know, over the next couple of years, this will pick up a lot of speed and that those prices should get come down a lot. But I think it, to be two to three times the cost of a normal mower, I think is um, a reasonable place for us to be looking at at this point in time. I think it, with um, that kind of pricing, it'll pay for itself based on what we've spoken to about landscapers and the usage that we've seen. Yeah. You, cut, you couple that with $1,000 a month for the software, basically having a robotic worker. So what's that, 12 grand a year for a robotic worker that never gets tired, never shows up with the brown mm -hmm. bottle flu and is always ready to strike April yeah. 1st, doesn't care if you use it seven times and on December, maybe once for a cleanup. Yeah, so um, you know, I think we, we, we look at a lot of data and, and fleet operations, the cost of operations, and, and our whole business is around making mowers that you can do more with. And at this point, it's always been about um, power and ground speed and these kinds of things because we've been you know, tied to having an operator on the mower. And actually, I think going back to the beginning of our company, we were a landscape company at one point, and we were running walk-behind mowers, and then the dual hydros came out. We, we created the Velky. That, so you could yeah. uh, you know, now go faster and you could walk and all that, right? That evolved in the stand-on mower. So we've always been focused from a landscaping perspective on the cost of production, um, that, whether it be downtime, speed, power, uh, and whatnot. And this is really exciting to me because I think this is really one of the next evolutions of um, the, those operating costs. Now we know that a, machine, a mower, by the time um, a mower has gone through its life cycle, It'll usually use somewhere around 70 to 80 grand uh, in labor. And so, you know, that's a really big number. And we're talking about significantly reducing that labor cost. Um, yeah, and we're know, finding it, less and less people are want to want to do it uh, for whatever reason. Um, I don't know, more people are getting out of the, the craft of this, this like awesome, amazing job that is hard, hard work, frankly. We've been doing it yeah. all summer and it's as a bunch of software guys. We've had to learn a lot. I'll be honest with you. Ed's been a great teacher. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's an interesting business. Um, you know, there's a great opportunity for anybody who's getting the landscaping business. Um, you get to make your own hours, but it's also a lot of hard work. You know, it's it's a you can you can be very successful, but it's uh, you know the summers are long and hot and that type of thing. And I think we do see that. We see less people wanting to get in the space. And for many landscape companies, they just can't grow because of the the labor needs. You know, I think it you know. Unemployment right now is up, but it's not to say that we don't still have some form of labor crisis. And um, I think that's a very, very real issue that we hear about all the time. Um, and that's part of what we're working together to, to address, um, that and the cost of production. Right now, there's more grass that needs to be cut than there are uh, people to do it. Uh, so we've got that $70,000 uh, number that most machines will use in labor. We're not going to eliminate the full $70,000 because you know, you still bring the machine out on the site, you mow the perimeter, those type of things. But to reduce that by 90% or 80% or something like that uh, ends up being a really big number and, you know, far exceeds the, um, the cost of the technology that we're talking about putting in here. Um, and so, and again, I think we're going to find over time, these returns are going to come faster and faster as we go. Well, you know, so, this, this stuff's not really that, that that new. I mean, I wish I could say that we were doing some super advanced stuff. There's some neat secret sauce in here, but honestly, this is just applied robotics. I mean, mm. self-driving cars have been innovating. The sensors that they create uh, are phenomenal, and they work great for this application. I mean, if you think about it, we're just striping a lawn, and, um, you know, safety's huge, and there's a ton of really great rock-solid obstacle detection that we use, depth-sensing cameras and some redundancy on there yeah. to basically just you know, stop. So we talk about the labor, we, we still do need people to mm -hmm. uh, basically mow the perimeter. And, and there's things that humans are just much, much better at, uh, you know, any detailed work, uh, be doing edging, weeding, but they can now do that while the mower is just striping, just going back and forth. That, that work that you would normally just put in your headphones and just kind of zone that's out. That's the big thing that's missing on the, on the small robotic mowers right now is that right now, nobody's figured out how to, to, to depart from this model of weekly maintenance. Yeah. Uh, you come out and you make the site look great. That's why people have a lawn service, whether right. it's residential or commercial contract. It's not just the mowing. And so I think what we're talking about bringing to market recognizes that we are still trying to turn around a property in the shortest amount of time on a weekly cycle. And I think that's where we see the market today. And we have to transition with the market. You know, I think it's a pretty long leap to say that you're going to leave a mower at a site for months on end and it's going to take care of things. Um, and that's, I think that's a very unique thing that we're doing compared to you know, most of the, uh, the uh, other robotic 
um, solutions that are out there today. Um, so we started getting into technology a little bit. Let's, let's talk about that a lot more. If you would, um, let's talk about the senses of the machine. Uh, you know, just what is it, what does it see, feel, know, what's coming into it, and then we'll talk a little bit about what the machine does with that information. Yeah, it's great. I, you know, I could talk about that forever, so Ed, cut me off if I go too far. <laughs> no, we, yeah, go for it. All right, so we, uh, we basically put a number of sensors on this mower, and with the help of Wright's amazing team, uh, if you've not, never done, seen their factory tour and, and what they can basically put out, uh, this mower is basically designed, ruggedized our sensor stack and made it into basically it looks like, I'm going I'm to say it, it's the Tesla of lawnmowers. Uh, so it's all built in and this, this particular model has five cameras, uh, so three in the front uh, and then two in the back. Uh, cameras are one part. These cameras are Intel depth sensing robotics cameras used for robotics, used for things like uh, you know, subterranean robots, they're great uh, in the outdoors, and basically they can see in depth. So that means they can know how far things are within uh, centimeter level, uh, about 15 meters out. So can you just take a quick second and describe sure. depth sensing and, you know, how that, how the, what, what that, let's say, what, what does that image look like? And, yeah, and how sure. Is it getting that image. It's actually tough to even visualize. Um, when we do visualize it and look at it, uh, us humans uh, who only really see in RGB or red, green, blue, and sort of the mm -hmm. color spectrum, you know, we see you know, normal light. But these cameras both see that as well as shooting out depth. So when we do visualize it, generally what we do is we color it. So you'll actually can see the image. What it looks like is a color spectrum of depth, and so it mm -hmm. knows basically. And what we do is we convert that to a point cloud. And a point cloud is just a standard robotics data structure for showing objects. Mm -hmm. And when objects of a certain size above the ground plane, which we know and project, uh, which is the grass that we're mowing, if we see an object uh, of any size, we stop. Mm -hmm. And that's and, it. And one of the neat things about this way visualization is that you know, those cameras know the difference between a shadow from a tree and a log on the ground, right? And so that's correct. It's, it's seeing something that a human typically doesn't perceive. And it does it in the dark uh, or, or in the light. It doesn't really care. At this point, we're not mowing the dark. But in theory, I mean, that's it's really uh, not, not that far out there, right? So yeah. we've got the cameras. What else do we have as, as senses? Sure. So a number of other things that we do. We're, our theory is that it's all about sensor fusion. And that's kind of the latest in robotics uh, is probabilistic robotics. So we take a bunch of sensor data, and then we make very good determination based on probabilities of where it is uh, and what it's doing. And we've gotten really good. So number of other sensors are we've got RTK GPS, which is centimeter level GPS. And that technology has just gone way down in cost. And we've been able to pass that on mm -hmm. to, to our customers, which is phenomenal. So if you can look at a property now, we can basically do centimeter level GPS. And that's mm -hmm. fascinating technology. I'd love to talk more about how that works. But it's pretty standard now mm -hmm. um, that you can do. And we don't even need a base station. Uh, it's just over the internet. So the, the uh, mower has uh, redundant uh, 3G connectivity. Uh, but it doesn't really need it. Uh, you can also use it with a base station if you really prefer. That has about a two kilometer range uh, for sites that you're doing uh, over and over again. So we've got- now you, now you can't just use, you can't just use GPS, right? There's other things right. you have to do in order for that machine to, to run dynamically in a solid fashion, right? That's right. So the other things that we fuse into it are odometry from the wheels. And we've mm -hmm. built a really great encoder that knows, you know, if the wheels are going forward and backwards so it can know if it's turning. You know, the wheels slip though, so it also combines that with something, a high grade IMU or inertial measurement unit. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the same thing you have on your iPhone to play those games where you tilt it. Uh, this one's a little more precise and, and better, but uh, we fuse that with odometry, with GPS, with visual odometry from the cameras, and all that gets a really good sense of where the mower is at all times. Mm -hmm. So let's say that uh, you lose track of GPS for 10 seconds or something like that, what happens? No problem. We've ran it uh, a couple times, uh, entire sites without the GPS. Uh, what will generally happen, though, is, is um, uh, you know, you may get, um, it may go a little off on sort of one of the uh, stripes, but then it'll, the whole thing lines back up. Uh, so if it goes out during the property, you may see a shift, but it, when it comes back in, you'll get it. And we, again, report that out. But all that's to say our software gets better and better, and uh, it hasn't been a problem. But yeah, GP, running without the GPS is fine. I think uh, if you run without the cameras, we don't allow it. So, you know, if for some reason, a, for whatever reason, if a camera comes disconnected, uh, it turns off. Uh, and uh, great news is, is that the mower still works manual. Because, I mean, we've been out there and it's just like, hey, we, we've been, we actually been mowing with this all summer and we got to get these jobs done. I got to get to the next property. So yeah. uh, that's the great thing about the technology too, is that it still works. So, so now that we've talked about the sensors and whatnot, let's, 
in a minute, let's talk in, about mapping. But before we get there, sure. let's talk about a little bit of the, the user interface, right? So, you know, one side of the dashboard has this, and the other side has that, and you have some buttons. So if you would, I, I know you're also changed, you have a, a philosophy of minimum user interface. I know yeah. you also changed the number of buttons. So let's talk about, you know, where you're headed with that workflow when somebody gets on the machine. Yeah, like you said, my, my, one of my main things is the best user interface is no user interface. I would just love it if it did it automatically. Now, we can't quite get there, so we've got two buttons, uh, which is fine. Uh, so the two buttons are real simple, and we've worked with Ed to design it to make sure that landscapers uh, can do, still do the job they want to do, and we have enough space on the control panel. Uh, but the way it works is two buttons. You press, uh, you boot up the mower, it boots up within 30 seconds. It's basically just a small appliance. Uh, and uh, it's ready to go. Uh, so then you press the map button and it starts blinking and telling you that it's, uh, it's mapping. And all you do is drive and mow the boundary of the area you wanna strike. Mm -hmm. And then once you get back, it actually lets you know via another light to say, hey, I'm ready. Uh, you point it in the direction you wanna mow and you press mow. You uh, step off and about 10 seconds later, the mower kicks on. Uh, make sure to put the uh, blades down. I always forget that, yeah. Ed, Ed never does, but I always do. Put the blades down, uh, and we, then we've 10 all done that at some yeah. point. You 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 mow a whole property, kind of not paying uh, attention. You come back, that's oh, all in. Yep. But uh, put the blades down, and then uh, you 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 step away. And about 10 seconds later, as long as you're not in in the path of the mower or near the back of the mower, mm -hmm. and four seconds, uh, it turns on the blades, and then another four seconds it goes. In the meantime, it's flashing a bunch of lights, uh, and uh, it it's pretty cool to see. It really just. Uh, slowly kind of takes off and then just when it gets up to speed it, as soon as it knows it just starts striping and just lays down some perfect stripes so at that point we've gotten pretty bored with it and because uh, we know it works and so generally we'll do something else like edging weeding blowing or mm -hmm. generally we'll, we'll actually sometimes eat lunch while it finishes the mowing which is pretty fun yeah yep uh and right now as, as it's designed there's there's one other switch in the middle and so sort of the right hand side of the instrument panel is your typical key switch and that kind of thing you can pull it out of the trail you can mow a slope, yeah, that's or you right. Can do that's whatever right. you want, and then there's a main switch you can toggle from that right side of the instrument panel over to the left side, and that's when now it's eligible for um, autonomous mowing and, and the other things kick in. And I think one of the things you added that I appreciate was a, a, an hour tracker, which we've been able to bump up the uh, hours pretty substantially since we've been developing this. So you can see right. your manual yeah, hours got, and your autonomous hours. Yep, we got two hour meters on there. It's it's neat to see. Um, so so we talked about the user interface a little bit. Um, you know, there's, we'll, we'll have, you know, a lot more footage out there and whatnot, and you all see kind of what the machine looks like. But our approach has been to make the machine look very much like a normal mower. It doesn't look a whole lot different. Um, we want to, that's part of one of our objectives. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit more. We talked about the sensors and the senses that the machine has. Now let's talk about um, the software piece of it. So uh, starting with, I think, the, the map concept, right? Sure. Yeah, so um, what we do is, is, is now the mower doesn't really need to be connected. The only reason it's connected to the internet is for the uh, data if you want to use without a base station. And the other thing it does is when it boots up, it updates. So uh, standard, uh, the way all almost all internet servers work, it, it does an app update and just basically gets the newest software. So fixes in tuning or faster turn, non-rutting, better slopes, all that stuff. We roll it out pretty constantly and pretty uh, almost daily. Um, so that software package runs on Linux. Uh, it's pretty standard, long-term support. Uh, a lot of internet appliances just run this and it just works. Uh, our software is based on the robotic operating system. We're huge fans. Hello, Open Robotics Org and all my friends there. Uh, we've become big contributors to it and uh, we've commercialized uh, part of it and uh, our stack and uh, we're open sourcing some of the other stuff like path planning and other things like that. But mm -hmm. the main stacks that uh, basically have it operate around is path planning. Uh, mm -hmm. And then the localization, which is a uh, fancy word for determining where it is on the map that it's created. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when when you've recorded your perimeter, it doesn't make up it doesn't make up a plan as it goes. At that point, it actually yeah. plots out the entire property in an efficient um, pattern with the stripes, you know, as the direction you left it. And then the remaining portion of that cut, it, it's going to be tracking those lines. That's right. Um, as it goes, right? Yeah, and so now right we, we to, to be fair, we did build a web interface uh, so you can actually pull out your phone and actually see the map and where it's done and the coverage and actually how long it's right. got to take. And you can see those lines that it's that it's done, the, uh, the stripe patterns with the nice sort of half wide turn that we do. 
So I, I would have to say that um, you, you guys have done some pretty neat stuff with tuning the turning. You know, how do you preserve the momentum? Oh, we're not, we're not done yet. <laughs> oh, I know you're not, but you know, it's, it's just really interesting to me that um, you can really perfect some of those things at a level where, I mean, at some level, it's almost like the machine has traction control because you have all these different sensors that are unique from what a human typically has. So uh, it's capable of a lot. It's capable of a very straight line and, and that type of thing. Um, yeah, totally. So, you know, you've, you've, you've been running this thing on a number of different sites and, you know, help us understand what's, what's the perception you get? You know, somebody who's walking by or whatever. I mean, what, what do you see? What's, how, how, do you, how do you see people accepting uh, this type of concept? Because, you know, this is, has a little bit of a futuristic feel to it, right? Yeah, you know, well, it's interesting actually, uh, and kind of sad because I wish they would love it a little bit more, but I tell you what happens generally is they see it, they look at it and they're like, oh, it's without a person. They might take a picture depending on, you know, who they are. If they're a landscaping crew, I love it. They take a picture and I go run and hand them a card. Uh, but uh, right. generally after that, they, they get bored. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of like uh, us in the landscape industry now that I'm in it, are, I constantly hear blowers and mowers, but I never did before because they're just all yeah. around. I'm sure you do, Ed. You probably know yeah. the engine. You're like, that's a that's a right standard ZK right there. I, but, uh, I can tell the difference between <laughs> engines. <laughs> I know you can. So, but uh, the perception has really been interesting. I think it's a little bit of amazement, but then very quickly goes into acceptance. In fact, we mow this one field that has um, a bunch of uh, people who are uh, doing exercise and walking it, mm -hmm. and they used to like, you know, when it was coming down the row. You know, they'd see it and they'd kind of stop and, you know, it'll stop if it gets in, they get anywhere near it. But, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, you know, they used to sort of stop and kind of do it. And now they don't even stop. They just know they've seen it once it just stripes and does its thing and it does it 15 times. They just walk right past it uh, and they don't care. Uh, yeah. It's been pretty wild. I, I kind of wish they had more you know, excitement around it, but it does its job really, really well. Let's just put it that yeah. way. But but I think the, the interesting thing to me is that, you know, it, as we've talked about robotics over the years and whatnot, you know, what is the level of exception, you know, acceptance, especially in, in a place like a public park or maybe an HOA or something like this? And, you know, what, you know, is there going to be pushback and that type of thing? And I think at this point, what you found is that, no, not really. I mean, people very accept it. They don't question what's going on. Um, you know, it's, it seems very organized, you know, nothing rambunctious is happening or whatever. And so um, people get used to it really quickly, it seems. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's kind of like, uh, you know, when, when I first, uh, I guess, experienced cruise control in my car, like I just kind of was like, well, hey, I'm going to hold my foot over the brake here because I don't trust it. But now I'm just like, oh, yeah, cruise control, it just kind of works. I mean, that's kind of how technology works. It's very yeah. slow creep. You know, you're just like, oh, of course. Yeah, of course it cuts the middle. Right. Why, yeah. why wouldn't it? And, and I'd actually argue, let's, so let's just swag, segue just a little bit into safety now. So, sure. um, I mean, I think at one level, what, one of the things that I'm looking at with this is that um, there is an opportunity for safety in terms of the operator, right? Um, you know, you're removing that person from the action, so to speak, and um, there's, there's an opportunity there. Uh, right now, this machine is really tuned in for wide open areas. Now, totally. So, so if, you're, if you're doing um, really high turn residential lots, you know, you're doing a residential property 15 minutes back to back, uh, this, this technology is not really tuned in there. I mean, not to say that you couldn't use it there, but that's not where it's most effective right now. This Agreed. is more for, for large areas. Um, and, and mostly flat areas. I mean, you, you can take on some slopes, but totally. nothing crazy, right? Yeah, do, yeah, don't give us any highway berms yet. Sorry, uh, some of my landscape customers, we're working on it. Sure, but I mean, I, we won't get into it today, but there's just, there's a lot of opportunity for, you know, what's in the machine to progress into solving some Absolutely. of those areas. So there's, yeah. there are huge safety advantages here. But let's, let's talk a little bit about safety from a bystander standpoint. So, so what are we doing there? Well, so one of the things that we do uh, is we, you know, we should admit that this is a dangerous job and that it's hard to reduce all of the risk associated with lawn, right. lawn cutting. So we're doing everything we can to reduce it and give more power to the operator to make those good decisions. So one of the things we do is we have a remote control uh, and we aren't playing around with this remote control. This is, you know, it's applied robotics. So it's by a company called Fort Robotics. Uh, they do mine clearing robots. And if you knew the technology inside of it, it's got dual redundant, secure encrypted, one kilometer range, you know, millisecond heartbeat kind of technology. We've actually done some slow-mo videos on it. And when you hit the stop button, it stops instantaneously, uh, mm -hmm. you know, faster than really a human can. I, I remember when we got trained on these stand-ons, the training says, you know, hey, if it gets kind of squirrely, you let go. 
which is mm -hmm. really hard to do. I mean, I, you know, you've been doing this for yeah. years, but yep. that training is, and there's that, that delay where you just want to grip it a little bit like, oh, I can control this. Yep. Robot has none of that uh, sense of like, uh, you know, hesitation. So when you tell it to pause or stop, it does it like that. Um, and the other thing that we're doing is if you ever take that remote or run to that battery or whatever, it just stops uh, and won't allow you to do it. And the reason we do that is because if there is a jogger running by, you do need to be able to stop and pause it. Now, if the jogger gets too close, the cameras will see it and it'll just stop. As soon as they move, uh, it'll keep going. Yeah, but, right, but we, yeah. we've got a lot of work to do on safety. Um, but I mean, I, I would argue now that, you know, I, I would put this up against uh, how tired I am at 6 p.m. Uh, you know, this mower does not blink uh, at 6 yeah, p.m. Right. It doesn't get tired. And it, it doesn't deviate from the policy that you gave it. You know, a, no. a, a human operator, you know, they can be in a rush and they can start, you know. Yeah, we've done it. Pushing the margins a little bit, you know, where you don't want to be. But this camera system, the rules are there and it's going to follow the rules all the time. And it stays and, at whatever speed you set it at. Um, yep. And uh, we're working on some stuff with engine ground speed modulation that's coming up uh, that will be mm -hmm. pretty awesome too. Yeah. And also just like, let's talk about the cameras just a little bit. So, you know, if one of the cameras is blocked or something like that, these cameras so many times a second have to confirm that there's nothing near the machine, right? That's so, correct. I, I, I'm a little reluctant to say necessarily fail safe, but that's the concept that we're talking about here where it's confirming constantly that there's a clear view uh, before it, you know, continues to, to do That's what right. Uh, and it's redundant. If you look at the field of view, we have some redundant sort of work over uh, um, where we're actually seeing and comparing uh, many, many times a second. So, yeah, I mean, it's crazy because if you throw something in front of it, you know, the mower stops uh, and if you don't move it, uh, it's just going to stay there as forever, really. It doesn't mm -hmm. like get bored or say, uh, you know, hey, screw it. I've got another job I got to do. I'm just going to run over this piece of trash or soccer ball. Right. Um, so we are uh, adding at some obstacle sort of going around for larger obstacles. But for now, again, like I said, it's we can cut the middle and reduce uh, all the work you have to do on these big job sites. And that's what we're really focused on right now. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it, at the beginning of this conversation, we said, hey, Wright and Greensy are working together. Um, you know, let's, let's talk a little bit about that, what that means. I mean, there's certainly some pieces of it that, you know, we're, we're on exploration together. So not everything is, you know, predictive and concrete. Well, let's talk about what our intentions are, where we're going. Sure. Well, you know, uh, I, I just got to tell this story. Maybe Ed doesn't know this, but I've been trying to, I've been trying to get a hold of Ed for like a year. Uh, and, uh, you know, I knew of them and I knew they were the most innovative. I, I knew about the, the, the introduction of the stand on, which we believe is the, is the best mower based on efficiency and amount of, that you could fit in a trailer and just kinematics. Like it's just the best mower, especially for autonomy, being able to jump on, jump off. And I, I sent out some feelers and nobody had sort of done it. And then one day I woke up and Ed had filled out our contact form. Do you remember that Ed? I do. Yeah. And so we were, do. we were flipping out. We were like, we were like, oh my God. Ed just filled out our contact form. Like, do I call him? Do I call him right away? It was almost like a uh, sort of girl crush. Like I was like, I don't know what to do. Should I? And I think I just remember picking up the phone. And uh, so I, I appreciate you doing that because uh, you took a risk on us, but we've come a long way since we started talking together and we've proven it. Uh, I think that's part of the thing. I think you were very skeptical as rightly so. Uh, you have high quality mowers, uh, self safety, uh, ruggedization, and, and you wanted to see that we were legit. So I think we proved it. Uh, I think we, I think we did. What do you think? Yeah, I think so. And I'll, I'll just fill in that story just a little bit. You know, I, I began seeing more and more that there was a need for us to, to understand the robotic space and get involved there. And, you know, I, I have dabbled a little bit with coding some stuff in the past and I started. Ed hasn't sent me any code yet, but I need him to, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to code review it. So I started binging on, on YouTube, just digging into everything I could learn about the, the different ways to approach robotics and the operating, operating systems that are out there and whatnot. And uh, you know, one, of, one of my kids was watching a lot of this with me. And we ran across some, some different pieces that you, you all had done with the robotics organization. And, and mm -hmm. I, it was like, aha, these guys are doing kind of the conclusions that I had already reached. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you were on that path. And so I think um, when we got in touch, you know, there was a certain amount of common ground already in terms of, of what we were looking for and where you were already already at. So, um, yeah, it was a very exciting uh, process, I think, in the short amount of time. I guess it's not that short, but in the amount of time that we've been working together now, uh, we've gotten pretty far. We, we have um, we got stuff running, working, and it's it's really not that far off from from, you know, from commercialization, commercialization. Yeah. 
That so is our intention. Yeah, it is absolutely. our intention. I mean, it's it, our intention is to go to market. Now, you know, right now we're in a phase where we're building pilot fleets. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so we're we're handpicking scenarios where we're running these machines, um, we're getting hours on them, we're working out ruggedization. Um, I would say the, the software is probably more ahead than the other aspects of it, and you continue to to improve and add and and do things there. Um, at capabilities in the past week, you've gotten some pretty neat stuff done. So we're, we're headed towards commercialization for sure. Um, in terms of, you know, when do we go to production or make these, these types of machines available for sale uh, to the public per se? Um, I think that's something we're still getting our mind around, um, but we're yeah. trying to try to get there as soon as we can, um, as, as soon as we reasonably can. Uh, yeah, you've been great about uh, making sure that we're doing that in a sustainable way. Uh, I don't think it benefits anybody to come out with something that we can't deliver on. Uh, we've seen a lot of that in the marketplace and this job is too important for, for people to get something that just doesn't work. And frankly, it works, but we got to make sure it does. Yeah. It has to be a lot more reliable than a, than a employee. Right. So, um, you know, I think the standard of expectation is as high and we have to be sure that this machine is ready for, ready for the battle zone. That's uh, correct. So we're working, working on a lot of those details, you know, the technology there is the, the, how the machine works, that's, that's all in place. And we're working on, on details um, to, to, to get there. Um, again, we talked a little bit about the cost side of things and I think that that'll come down, but right now we're, we're talking two to three times the cost of a regular machine plus a subscription service uh, to support, you know, once once a machine is out there, I mean, the sky's the limit in terms of what you can add to it, right? The, the computer hardware that's in place is capable of almost anything you want to throw at it, right? That's right. Um, so there, this subscription is really important in, in part of how we get there. Um, so just let's, let's go back a little bit. Tell us a little bit about GreenZ as a company. You know, when did you, you know, how did, how did you form this and piece it together and and how long you've been doing it and whatnot. Sure, we've been around two years uh, and we are venture backed. Uh, I'm, I've invested in it, my co-founder invested in it, and then we grabbed a bunch of green industry experts who knew a ton more about the industry than I did. I had done a small investment in a company called Lawn.com that uh, didn't work out so well because lawn mowing is a hard business, but uh, learned a ton. Mm -hmm. uh, but I've always been building software. It literally, uh, my favorite project is at home all of the shades in my house are from different manufacturers, these roller blinds, but yeah. they all go up and down automatically based on sunrise and sunset and it just mm -hmm. works. So mm -hmm. to me, the, it's fascinating the, the mix between uh, hardware and software and I've always loved it. And um, I came to my friend, David, who is my co-founder and um, you know, I said, hey, let's, let's start something. And he said, hey, listen, why is my robo mower so dumb? He literally had that question. I think we were at his lake house and he was watching it and it got sure. stuck and he was complaining because uh, he had asked the installer to, to make sure it goes all the way to the edge and he didn't quite get it. So there's still this little stripe that he has to like get somebody to come mow and the landscaper didn't like it. He's like, Oh, it's always getting stuck. And you know, so he was like, why are they so dumb? He's like, I have this Tesla. That's just, it gets better every week. Like I, there's a new yeah. feature. Like I could just hit update. And he's like, why is there no software version? And I was like, I don't know. Why is there no software version? And I think, uh, I got obsessed, like absolutely obsessed, which is what I do. Uh, and, uh, I had to solve this. And I, I thought about it, like I figured out, like we went research kind of similar to you, I think a little, little sooner though, is, is said, could this be done? Mm -hmm. uh, I was very skeptical. I, I like setting hypotheses that are, you know, and I love proving myself wrong. And I said, why has this not been done? Why is this doing this? And I, I don't know, I, I, I still come to think that I, I just don't think anybody is really focused on it the right way. I think there's a lot of robotics companies that love robotics and I love them and, you know, bless them for like absolutely wanting to redesign the wheel. Mm -hmm. uh, I happen to like the tweels that are on this thing. They have a lot of innovation and the cutting deck on this is really, really good. There's no reason for me to reinvent that. So I, I said, let's grab a, a really good mower and let's just make it smarter. Let's add mm -hmm. autopilot and call it auto striping and let's just do it. So I've been at it uh, for two years full time. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's my job. I started recruiting uh, software developers who wanted to join me in my journey. We have big mission, we have big plans. Uh, you know, after we help uh, landscapers become more successful, we got bigger, bigger fish to fry and helping people out. Mm -hmm. So I said, let's do it. So we started and uh, my belief, you know, one of my theories is iteration. Mm -hmm. I believe the perfect product that never sees the light of the day sucks and, sh and, yeah. and, and something that is good enough and works and can be improved is amazing. And if you just want to see how that works, go look at our videos from a year ago and look where we are now. 1% right. every day will get you 72% better. That's right. That's right. Every year. That's how it works. Uh, so, you know, if, if 
Well, one, one other quick question here. So you, you've worked with electric mowers and you're working with robotic mowers. And, and I think you probably have a little bit more of a futuristic perspective than, than a lot of us um, in, in this industry. Um, you know, and I think for many years, it was my feeling that we were going to see large commercial electric mowers long before we'd see uh, robotic mowers. Uh, but I now, you know, in the situation that we're in right now, I think that's not the conclusion that we've arrived at. Uh, but, but, you know, from your standpoint, what do you see it happening in that space? Well, you know, uh, we've, we have been using some commercial electric yeah. mowers and, and, and I like them. Uh, I'm hesitant to, to talk bad, but they just don't last. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I guess I kind of knew and Last thought, in terms of endurance, right? The, the reliability is fine, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So sure. I'm just talking about a normal day. Like you get out there at 10 a.m., you know, software engineering time, uh, not at 7 a.m., unfortunately, you get out there at 10 a.m. and you really, it, it goes until maybe three mm -hmm. uh, and then we're done. We have to pack it up and we got to go recharge for 12 hours. And um, I, I just don't think the battery technology is there. I, I think there's going to be some innovations there, but as it stands now, they just don't last for what a, a real day of mowing looks like. I mean, we show up sometimes and I guess got to be honest with you with not enough people that, you know, the grass is not just a little third cut. We missed yeah. it last week and it's wet and the blades are going to get clogged down and the battery just goes boom, just way down. Um, even with some of the more efficient stuff without the person on it, we just haven't been able to get the runtime that we wanted. Now I do, I definitely do think it's coming, but uh, with mm -hmm. some of the efficient gas powered uh, mowers that we have and, and if I can get you to remove those cup holders from this one, I think we can get even better. Yeah, we so, don't need that anymore. You need the fuel. And I think it, and, <laughs> And what we're talking about today is a very particular use case. Again, we talked about how we're mowing large areas. That's right. Typically, that's where your maximum need for endurance runtime yeah. um, is. Yeah, if you're, so you're spending all day driving and at the quick trip, then yeah, then maybe the electric will work. But uh, yeah. if you're mowing. I think it's going to be interesting to see when the two technologies converge. I mean, at some point that'll happen in the future. But I think uh, you know, right now we need to see battery uh, capacity or cost, however you want to put that you know, uh, come down. So uh, just to round up things, so if anyone's interested in more information, um, being in touch, you know, and, and whatnot, what's the best thing for them to do? Go to greensy.com. Go find out more about us. We'll put some show notes uh, and some links in the, uh, in the end, but uh, come visit us, come find out, uh, check out our, our channel, check out Wright's channel. It's going to be showing a little bit about that as well as some other new products. Yep. I'm sure you guys are working on stuff all the time, but uh, we're yep. excited to do this. So check us out on YouTube. Yeah, and I, I would say the same thing. Uh, you know, you, you've been regularly putting out uh, different pieces of information on, on YouTube. You know, you've been working through some of the different technical functions of the machine, showing people right. how that works. So I would really encourage anyone to go over there and subscribe to, to your channel. Also, um, you, you regularly are putting stuff out that you're doing on Instagram. So that's a great way to keep a pulse on things. Same on the right side. You're probably going to get more regular content around uh, robotic mowers on the Green Z channel, but also if you subscribe to Right, um, uh, Facebook, YouTube, or Instagram, uh, you'll also you know follow along with us as this technology develops. It's really going to be really interesting to see where we are in a couple of years. This is unique because a lot of times when we're, we're doing product development, we're often very confidential about it. In this case, this is you know an exploration, and we value that people watch this type of content, the comments that we put out there, you know, we, we read these comments, we respond to them, that type of thing. Um, so this is a very valuable process as we go on this journey together. And I'm just really excited to see where it goes. Um, you know, there's, there's all kinds of use cases. This is a very uh, interesting use case. And I think um, there's a lot of opportunity for you and, and your customers to run more efficient uh, businesses and get more done uh, with the same costs and, and whatnot. So this is going to be very exciting and, uh, you know, stay in touch. Awesome. Appreciate your time. Thanks, Ed. Talk to you later. Yep. Bye.